Wafting Introspection by Eric Olson. There is a certain type of peace to be found at night when one is outdoors with only the sounds of nature, while everyone else sleeps, recharging their bodies and minds for the coming day. I sit and try to find this peace, and I contemplate how the world all fits together. On such a night as described, I find myself initiating the familiar steps of my ritual. My steps are few and the work is easy, but I follow them to the letter. There is something ceremonious about doing a thing that one does often, exactly in the way that one always does it. My mother makes her coffee the same way, in the same order, every morning. I suppose these constants in life bring us comfort. The whole process really began some time ago, when a seed was fertilized in the womb of the earth. Its tendrils broke free, some snaking downward in search of nutrition, another straining upwards to glimpse the light of life. The warm rays of the sun imbued energy into this plant and the moist soil beneath powered its growth. Eventually, it brought forth blooming, pungent flowers, and these flowers are now in my possession. My work begins by grinding them finely, but not before I take time to examine them. They truly are beautiful flowers, with their dark hues of green, sometimes flecked with purple, others with orange. The trichums shine like a morning dew upon the grass. The resulting fluffy ground matter sticks to my fingers as I guide it carefully into its receptacle. This is where the process can undergo alterations. Whether the herb is cylindrically embraced in a combustible sheet or fitted snugly into a glass percolator, the goal and results are inevitably the same. Now is when the ritual truly begins, everything preceding being mere preparation. A flame is needed, any match or lighter will do and it all takes place outside. This is imperative, the endless height of the atmosphere is necessary. I don't enjoy the feeling of inhaling anything but pure air from said atmosphere, and I hold no delusions that anything but is healthy. Yet as the smoke passes my lips, I find myself breathing in deeply. I expel the cloud outwards and upwards. It wafts away into the night sky, and I close my eyes. I hear the faint laughter of others, neighbors out enjoying this night as well. I hear the crush of aluminum cans, the clink of glass bottles. They too are altering their consciousness. The only difference is that I am a criminal, and I am committing a criminal act. There is an illogical hypocrisy surrounding my culture's use of consciousness-altering substances. Historically and factually, I understand how our situation has reached this point, but it is by no means right or fair. We maintain certain contradictions that we just can't seem to come to terms with as unreasonable as so they remain and they fester. This giggling, loosening, muddling elixir is just what you need. You deserve it, in fact. This herb, however, well this herb is only for the immoral reserved for the delinquents, for the streets. Um, now I realize the flame has gone out. Not to worry, fire is plentiful. It's the plant matter that is to be conserved. As the feelings set in, my eyes move from one star in the sky to the next, individually. The chirping sounds of frogs and insects become an ambient symphony to my ears, and I take another draw. Who am I kidding, really? By no means am I oppressed for doing this, the others simply view it differently through a separate generational lens. I suppose the problem is that I am meant to respect these people and to look to them for encouragement and for validation. This is where my anxieties stem from, the disconnect that I find impossible to ignore. I don't like the word vice either. I choose to do this. If there is a mode of existence in which the battle of life is fought empty-handed, I have yet to discover it. Perhaps that mode is attained by those who, in fact, do not see life as a battle, but instead as a dance. We are bound to take wrong steps. We may even tread on another's toes or have our own stepped upon, and the dance resumes. But what happens when a sword comes out and someone is stabbed? Can the dance ever resume? 
The blood is all over the floor, everyone seems to be stepping in it. What if someone slips? Someone is bound to slip. I sometimes feel the sting of that sword on my own skin, and I don't even know who is wielding it. The hilt could be in my own hand. Perhaps it's not a dance, but a forward march. Should we all stand in line, in step with whoever is ahead and behind us? Whatever the case is, I don't feel like dancing, marching, or fighting, so I take another hit. The taste is of burnt sweetness, the texture thick on my tongue. Water is always to be kept at hand during the process. I reach for it and take a long sip. This is a step of the ritual rarely forgotten. Water is life, not fire. Though, this fire can project dazzling light over the surface of the pond. At this point, I feel as though I'm being too bitter. Perhaps this conflict in my mind is just so, all in my mind. Perhaps no one even cares enough for it to matter. But, what a happy ending that would be. I fear many of us care too much, myself included, and that we all must pick a side. And yet it isn't about sides, is it? It can't be that black and white, can it? Sometimes I wish it was, but that would be too simple. There is nothing simple about this life. We can't even decide on the rules. How can we, when we have to make them ourselves? Who has the loudest voice, or the biggest stick? God would be a great help, if only he would make use of himself. I wish he would take control. Perhaps he has. I think these thoughts to myself as I take another hit, and I open my eyes to begin to look around at my surroundings. I have shelter. There are rooms inside this shelter filled with food and clean water. This is more than what many other have prayed for. What reason have I ever had to feel unhappy? I look away from my house and gaze back out towards the woods. I wonder about the insects and the frogs that provide the soundscape. Do they feel? Do they feel anything without the burden of conscious self-awareness? Alas, now the flame has gone out for the last time. Only ash remains, and the night is solely illuminated by the moon. I bury the ash, so the cycle of natural growth may continue. And then, I go to bed, since my own cycle of natural growth must continue as well. This is when I realize, I've been worrying about nothing because nothing makes sense, and now, that makes all the sense in the world. With everything to worry about, there is simply no worry. When faced with such simplicity, how could we not make things complicated? This is where the comfort lies. I hope these introspections shed light into any sort of unilluminated place. But for now, my ritual has ended, until I wake again tomorrow. Hey, look what I got, by Zoya Vats. Hey, look what I got. Claire ran to her open-armed mother and accepted the offering, embracing the warmth as the feeling of glee overtook her completely. She would never let herself forget the happiness her mom's touch would give her, the blanket of comfort and security it created, a safe haven. Every so often, the young girl let herself imagine the absence of such familiarity. Being stripped of all she knew being left alone to fend for herself. Perhaps she would no longer remain in the same reality, perhaps the truancy of her everyday life would be the downfall she feared. A void. She would be in the void. The actuality of everything yet nothing, a bundle of nullity where all other souls were left to lay in their own solitude. The surge of continuous emotions converging to create a single, thread-like wave. While she lay in her bed, Claire often wondered if that was the existence of people amounted to, was there truly no greater purpose? All the talks of higher powers and being, were they all to build a deceiving mask? What did you get, hun? A soft, honey-like voice that on its own elicited such joyous laughter from her baby. It wasn't rare for her mother to sever her hidden train of thoughts, thoughts that if revealed would shatter any possibility of happiness, a broken mirror, facade piercing those walking past with its wailing fallen shards.
In response to the question lay a scintillating smile on the woman that caused an ache in her high, flawless cheekbones. An expression of tenderness lighting up and highlighting every single feature of her face. Brunette hair with honey blonde streaks perfectly framing the crystal-shaped face deep blue eyes that reflected a graveyard-like ocean. An empty, large body of water that resembled a calm yet disrupted state of mind. An ocean that could calm any person in need of strength and hope, yet leave them with lingering feelings of disturbance and inability. Waving the flimsy certificate around, Isabel watched as her child recited the yearly mantra. I made the honor roll. The deadly jovialness that emitted from the larger body seeped into every corner of the room, turning a calm atmosphere into an excited, histrionic one. The older woman slowly reached for Claire's hand, grabbing it and ushering her into their cramped living room. With a flick of the wrist, a series of cliched, romantic tunes filled the atmosphere. Amplified thumps pounded against the wood floor as legs danced and jumped around, leaving both individuals fatigued, the younger left wheezing, grasping simultaneously for any excess air and her inhaler. Look at you go, that's great, I'm so proud of you, Aphrodite. The use of her since birth nickname and sheer satisfaction in her mother's voice was worth everything, even the collapsing lungs begging for assistance. She was brought in for another tender hold so tight that her lungs heaved further. This time, pillow-like lips made contact with an overly large forehead. It struck Claire as strange, though, the lack of vehemence in the action. Instead, there lay a piercing cold that taunted and provoked. An oddity. Nevertheless, the twelve-year-old child wasn't about to delve into this peculiar mystery. Didn't I tell you to not overexert yourself, though? With Isabel's mouth still placed on her child's temple, the speech came out muffled, nearly incomprehensible. Whatever. A scoff resonated. I'm not a kid anymore. I can handle myself, I have been for the past seven years. Frustration was apparent in her high timber as she released a successive chain of forced exhales. Exemplified rings of guilt and torment hit Isabel's heart. She understood nothing if not the conflicting feelings her daughter was facing. At an age where most would be visiting malls and staying as far away from home as possible, Claire was an outcast. An invisible, vigorous power consistently pushed the isolated girl outside the imperceptible barrier and jeopardized any attempts she made at connecting. Her severe, persistent asthma subjected her to a great deal of harassment and unknown to her human shield, it blemished what the adults in her life considered. Untouched parts of her mind, it baffled Claire the extent to which her mother and family tried to shelter her from the horrors and debauchery of this world. They attempted to create a painting in which their baby could stay imprisoned, that of red tulips that swayed and twirled to the melody of the wind, joining all the other vegetation. Together, a collective of harmonious voices, they sang until the blue ripples smoothed into a state of non-being. The superficial cycle would continue for decades, no hindrances in its path. Alas, no patterns could fix the pain and suffering of the plants, their continued lack of motivation and purpose remained hidden on the surface. Sh now let's not start this again, yeah, you're perfect as it is and we don't need to do this a few days before Christmas. An attempt to console the person she had let into this world, the one who kept her from breaking, from falling victim to the constant hurdles that never failed to appear. The lack of depth in Isabel's word choice was apparent, but Claire managed to make do and discontinue the mundane disagreement. Regardless of her reaction, the desperation loitered in the air, threatening to suffocate and drown the two. They waited in anticipation, almost waiting for the slice of tension to be handed to them. Claire decided to make the first move amidst the awkward silence, walking away with a quiet mutter of acknowledgement. What had been said, neither could quite understand. Isabel discreetly moved to their kitchen and prepared an appetizer. 
feast, to dissipate the sudden barricade of communication that had made itself known. Bringing out a cream-colored platter, she set it out onto their worn-out, rusty counters and began setting any snacks they had left onto the blank canvas of welcoming. By the time she had managed to finish, night had hit. The moon amplified otherwise hidden stars that rested on the pond near them. Crickets had begun rehearsing their daily rituals as all else lay silent in their surroundings. The clouds overhead were brooding, dark with anticipation of the storm to come, however, they'd successfully avoided overshadowing the moon. Isabel often wondered about the relationships of nature. How each distinct element conveys the crucial messages humankind constantly ignores. She longed to communicate with Mother Nature and her unique creations, the magnetic pull of turbulent danger. Aphrodite. Her voice had become raspy, beaten and deprived of the hydration it desperately needed. The only response she had managed to identify was the theme of the crickets, upbeat yet laced with warning. Claire. She called out again, this time with greater potency. Following the lack of acknowledgement, Isabel began trudging towards her daughter's room. Swinging her door open, she found her daughter nestled into the nook of the large panda she had received for her birthday. A watery smile lay on her face, tranquil and unknowing of the news she would receive in the coming days. Shuffling towards her, the older woman placed a gentle kiss on Claire's cheekbone. Time seemingly stopped, working in their favor and allowing Isabel to cherish the moment she was experiencing and would forever remember. With a final glance at the rusting grandfather clock placed in the corner of the room, which signaled midnight, she turned off the lights with an unnoticed smile and quietly closed her daughter's door. Peace was preserved. For now, if nothing else, Fear No Shadow by Brian Stanton Ignorance is the soil of lies, darkness nourishes the roots. Dad. Currently, Grumpkin didn't have lips, but if he did, he would have licked them. All he had was eyes, and they narrowed on the plump object in the room. When's that blasted moon coming? I'm tired of being so flat, I wanna sink my teeth into one of these toys. Flegdrake rolled his yellow eyes. Remind me never to shadesk up with you again, you've got the patience of a piranha. Grumpkin's red eyes burned, turning the shadows under the little bed crimson. I happen to be a very patient skipper, thank you very much, but look at all those treats, he's even got a plushie, think of how much cotton's in that. I can't wait to gobble it up, how many times I gotta tell you. This ain't a gobbling job, this is a napping job, we ain't got time for cotton chewing. Grumpkin huffed, Toynopin better pay well, all I gotta say better pay real well, all this waiting around. Fleg Drake's eyes squinted in a smile. It does pay well something about this boy, Grimwicker said he'd give us enough cotton to fill our tummies for months, if we can snatch the lion from him. Grumpkin's eyes flashed, a stuffed lion. You're a glutton, you know that, a gluttonous little shadescupper. Yes, it's stuffed but no, you can't eat him. Flegdrake cleared his throat in a bubbly cough. Besides, this one is different, he's stuffed with flax seeds, parents can warm it up or something. Warm it up, seeds, yuck, humans are so weird. Flegdrake opened his mouth to speak but paused. A single beam of pale moonlight cut through the slatted blinds like a sword, lighting the far wall of the room in a gash of luminescence. This is it, he said, now's our chance. The bed above them creaked with movement, and the shadow skippers froze. Fleg Drake looked up. Shh, they looked to the wall. Two gashes of light striped the far side of the room, and then three. When the moon had drifted to the center of the window and shone through the blinds, illuminating the wall in a ladder of light, they made their move creeping out from under the bed slowly. Grumpkin hesitated as he reached for the first rung of the ladder confirming that it was indeed moonlight, and not any of the poisonous alternatives like sunlight or streetlight. When his long black tendril latched onto the first step, 
the appendage grew out from the flat wall, the moonlight imbuing him with a third dimension. He continued to ascend, slowly, feeling his body fill the shadowed void that had replaced everything but his eyes. When he stepped away from the wall, he was in full figure, towering over the boy's bed with his red eyes and a host of serpentine limbs. Fleg Drake coughed as he climbed the moonlight, his whispered hacks becoming rounded and tonal, echoing in that three-dimensional way. He smiled, it felt good not to be flat anymore. Shadowscuping had its perks dashing between shade sources and the blink of an eye was fun being as silent as a whisper, efficient but being whole again reminded him how much he wanted to be home, in under, watching the moonset from his balcony. Would you quit your hacking, getting on my case for being a little hungry? I'd rather be impatient, than loud, now let's get this lion and get out of here. Flegdrake flashed a set of jagged teeth. Grumpkin shivered, feeling a momentary wave of vertigo. He found Flegdrake's huge mouth and deep, dark, throat disturbing. Would you keep that thing shut, makes me feel like I'm gonna fall in. Besides, your breath is going to wake the boy up. You smell like a coffin. Excuse me, Fleg Drake said. Who's calling the shots here? When he spoke the breath from his massive mouth swirled around the room, a paper drawing of a lion flapped against the wall, dangling from a thin piece of tape. The vibrations of his deep voice shook the walls of the room. As a shadow all he could do was whisper but now his voice boomed when he spoke and he had to force the quiet into his words. Just grab the lion and get out of here. The two monsters stared down at the little lump of blankets covering the small boy. Grumpkin spoke first. Why do you think Grimwicker wants the boy's lion so badly? What's so special about it, or the boy? Look around, Fleg Drake said. What's missing in this room? Grumpkin spun around and scanned the place. I dunno, nothing seems out of the ordinary for a kid his age. Don't see no nightlight, do you? Grumpkin looked again. He did not see a nightlight. That's odd. It is, Fleg Drake said. Very odd. This boy, apparently, is not afraid of the dark. Not afraid of the dark. Impossible. Apparently it is possible, and Grimwicker thinks the lion gives the boy courage. Take the boy's lion, and he'll fear us again. Grumpkin thought about this for a moment. So you're saying the boy doesn't fear us because of that seed stuffed toy? I guess so. Flegdrake tried to suppress a throaty cough. Grimwicker seems to think the boy is dangerous. Dangerous? Grumpkin laughed. Him. Grimwicker thinks any child who isn't afraid of the dark could pose a threat to underbed, even Closidon. Courage casts its own light, he told me, if it should fall on underbed well, it won't be pretty. Ridiculous, Grumpkin scoffed, jabbing a tentacle toward the blanket. This is ridiculous, why don't we just wake the boy up, and show him what really lurks beneath his bed? No, Fleg Drake yelled but Grumpkin had already torn the covers away. What in the cellar furnace is that? Grumpkin said. Both monsters cocked their heads trying to interpret the shape before them. That's not a kid, Fleg Drake said. It's it's just a heap of stuffed animals. Wrong, a young voice said behind them. That right there is a trap. Before the shadow skippers could react, the boy flipped a switch and light harsh, moonless, light pierced them from every direction. Flegendrake roared and the room quaked. Books dropped from shelves. Papers and posters fell from the walls. Grumpkin whipped a black tendril toward the boy but a sharp beam of incandescent light blasted from a flashlight in the boy's hand and severed it in the air. The monsters screamed and shrunk back. His flesh rippled and twitched. His tentacles writhed. And then he was flat again, a dark blotch against the wall, two quivering eyes. Then Fleg Drake saw the boy snatch something away from the lens of his flashlight, a green, star-shaped object. His eyes widened, the star continued to glow even as the boy reared it up into the darkness above his head. 
You messed with the wrong kid. Nobody touches my stuffed animals. Then he hurled the object. A blur of green sword toward Fleg Drake too fast for him to dodge. When it struck the monster, it blasted him back against the wall, and he too became a splash of shade. With tormented cries, two pairs of glowing eyes, red and yellow, dashed back beneath the bed and disappeared into the world of darkness, returning to underbed empty-handed, hurt, and humiliated by the boy who fears no shadows. Fanfare by Karen McDermott What first hit me was the cold. What I first hit was the printer. Daft to leave the tray poking out over the bin everyone was discarding their cupcake cases in. There were fans on every desk. As well as overhead fans. The flapping of neon post-it notes forming the disco lights of the party. All the windows were wide open, the sounds of gulls and sirens added to the mix of the whirring of the blades and the hens clucking going into overdrive as they welcomed me, the new chick. I would like to say it was all in celebration of my arrival but it was also the retirement of some grizzled team leader I was meeting for the first time that day, then would most likely never see again. I bent down to pick up the pen I'd pretended to drop, actually a move to get brief respite from the line of the hellfire halitosis of the woman training me, and saw there were fans under some of the desk's two pointed groin words. I felt my own one wince at that vision of its future. Someone had tuned a dusty radio to a 60s pop hit station. Sensible penny loafers were having their time to shine, tapping on an already threadbare slate grey carpet. I regretted my own choice of black knee-high boots with their two and a half inch heels. I had wanted to add a little height to my 5-1 frame. Instead I looked like a slut with a hobble. That's the last time I rely on the fashion pages of Cosmopolitan magazine. Enforced fun. The worst kind. I just wanted to get back to my desk. I needed to get in touch with it to sort out their mistake when they were setting me up with an email address. It's J-O-D-I-E, not J-O-D-Y. Not like I had to send them a million forms with my name spelled as it should be beforehand or anything. Maybe it's their idea of fun, when they're not spying through the webcams. Someone whose name was Sally or Sarah is exclaiming over my nose ring. Does it hurt? What happens when you have to blow your nose? You could just hear the double question mark. I was used to it from men on dating apps following up from messages they'd sent milliseconds ago, less so from women I was meeting for the first time in a professional setting. I could tell Sally or Sarah was just itching to touch the ring. I'd been warned of the golems from accounts by a friend who'd just left the trust. I managed to slip away after distracting her by pointing out the dollop of coleslaw adorning her cardigan. Someone it took me a month to figure out was called CC, not Sissy, was fanning herself. The hot flushes, they're non-stop, never get old, mullively with a patient information leaflet on eating disorders while simultaneously demanding I pile my floppy paper plate high from a beige wobbling pyramid of sausage rolls. On closer inspection of the buffet table I was surprised to find their vegan counterparts. I suppose not having a plant-based option would result in human rights violation emails to HR from the girl I spied with the too short fringe. The shorter the fringe, the shorter the temper, so I found. I'd be annoyed too if I had been given that haircut. I think because we're similar in ages I'm expected to gravitate towards her but I'd rather be alone with the homemade samosas I'd just spotted. I was about to pocket a handful of after eights so I could have them later at the designated time the brand creators had in mind but then became ensnared as soon as my fingertips brushed the little square envelopes. I had to pretend to listen to a rare fox among the hens superciliously drone on about the apprenticeship in information governance he co-ran. I told him I'd like to at least complete my mandatory training first, Unfortunately, he took that to be a joke, guffawing and spraying cheesy biscuit crumbs. 
he actually gave me a business card when he got a hold of himself again, as though I couldn't just look him up on the intranet. I caught a couple of the hens twinkling beady eyes at each other. Sorry to disappoint, Sally or Sarah and an or Anita, this isn't the start of some office romance. This is the start of me collecting evidence to tell the green team how trees were being killed so Andrew could enjoy the feeling of shoving his face in my palm, given he wouldn't be shoving it anywhere else on me anytime soon. At least three of the phones are ringing, but nobody is answering. Not when there are snacks. I muffled a sigh. I was there to work. I was there to change things. From the inside, I had experienced all the failings of the healthcare system as a patient, what with years of misdiagnosis since a young girl. The blackouts that were put down to puberty, hormones, not enough exercise, not enough vitamin C in my diet. The mood swings. The constant pain. Being asked all the time and always by a new consultant, never the one I'd seen last, if I was taking recreational drugs. I was angry, but I was ready. I'd get through this dreary do fix the fuck up with my name, then I would start to help those in need. Because I knew the wilderness of being knocked off the waiting list for unclear reasons. I knew. A proffered miniature plastic cup of warm orange juice snaps me out of my reverie. The strip lights, the cause of so many of Morian's migraines, lest we forget, shimmer and dance on the surface of the liquid, drawing me forwards. I dive in. So sweet. A nervous new girl places a lilac-colored envelope on the corner of my desk where I'll read 30 of the same platitudes scrawled inside, or at least try to while the flies and the phones buzz around my decaying carcass before it goes straight into the recycling bin when I get home. Happy retirement Jody. Never get old. Never get old.